Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you can all hear me well. Uh, this morning, I would like to tell the story about how Picnic, who has been cloud native from the start, decided to go on premise and ultimately also decided to go back again. So uh, let's go. First, a short introduction about myself, just to know uh, who I am and how I was involved with all of this. My name is Gijs van der Voort. I work now for about three years with Picnic, where initially I started off as the uh, founder of the platform, Python platform team to launch Python as one of the key languages to be used within the company. But already quickly on, I got involved with the infrastructure team at Picnic and took up the, law, the role of product owner, um, uh, which I've been now been focusing for for the last two years or so. I've uh, been in the field a little bit longer, so this was not my first core organization and was uh, primarily involved with the ad tech industry up until then, where there was quite a bit of infrastructure involved with uh, running real-time bidding platforms for advertisements. Not so cool. Now my mother finally knows what kind of work I'm doing, which before she had no clue of. So what does Picnic really do? Well, ultimately, we are uh, a grocery delivery service. Um, back then, we were one of the first. Now, of course, there's many competitors on the market. And one of the things that we do differently than especially the flash delivery services that you see nowadays is that we deliver, uh, we position ourselves as a milkman 2.0. So the milkman in the Netherlands was this, this friendly face that would come at your door at a regular basis to deliver the groceries that you ordered in an earlier stage. And we want to replicate that kind of experience where it's friendly faces that you know that come on your doorstep, but now you do not have to order with him, but you can do it from the comfort of your mobile phone. And that's quite nice. In order to do this, um, uh, the way that we differentiate ourselves from these flash delivery services is by actually fully controlling the supply chain, uh, which allows us to deliver the groceries without delivery fees, which is quite nice. Um, we can actually offer a wider variety of different products because we uh, have a bigger sort of supply chain that has a bit more latency because we do not do let's say within the next 30 minutes deliveries, but therefore we can actually give you groceries for competitive prices compared to the regular grocery stores and with a big inventory of products that you can select from. So that's a bit of what we do. In order to facilitate, we control pretty much the entirety of the supply chain, except of course for the products that are still being uh, produced somewhere and then from there being shipped to us. Infrastructure at Picnic is um, uh, was cloud native from the start. So everything is running in AWS, uh, where we were running EKS at its core. Um, we try to make use of most of what AWS is, is supplying. Uh, so uh, our ingress controller, for example, is uh, uh, the AWS AOB. Um, and we try to keep a quite a consolidated stack of technologies. Uh, this allows us to specialize within those technologies and maximize uh, sort of the benefits that we get out of this. And as we grow and new teams join the company or new people join the company, they can easily pick up the learnings that we did on all of those technologies for new products that they're starting to launch. And so with this consolidated stack that we manage via Terraform and Spacelift to orchestrate all of this, we uh, enable teams with a nicely prepackaged uh, solutions so that they can focus on their deployments that are then running in Kubernetes um, uh, which we expect them to maintain. So infrastructure at Picnic is about the tooling around the deployments and the development teams are actual DevOps teams that are both do the building of the software but also the operations of the software. <coughs> so what we do, let's say, on a daily basis, so a big part of the supply chain that we uh, that, that, that make up our uh, uh, offering to our customers is actually taking uh, the products that are shipped to us from the producers and turning it into something that we can actually deliver to our customers. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with our, our proposition, but uh, the small EPVs that we have, the electric vehicles to deliver the groceries are quite iconic and you see them everywhere across the Netherlands now. Uh, and those are fully tailored to the specific service that we supply. And turning all of those groceries, those big, big pallets of chunky uh, uh, stuff, turning it into something that we can actually comfortably deliver to somebody's doorsteps is a lot of work. Um, you have to imagine that you know uh, uh, these different products, they all have different behavior of how to treat them. So for example, we have frozen goods which need to be kept below zero. We have chilled products that need to be kept below seven degrees. And of course we have our reg regular products, but even then you have stuff that can easily break. So a bag of chips, you cannot put it under a bottle of Coke in uh, a tote that you're shipping out. 
And that adds a lot of complexity to this process, which he initially set out to do fully manually. So actually turning these kind of pallets into the things that we deliver, a lot of manual labor involved. And exactly that was something that we want to stop doing. This is exactly sort of the bottleneck that comes up in uh, an organization like this. It's really hard to scale up. You have to imagine that the process that we've uh, implemented is effectively a huge, massive supermarket, an industrial-sized one that is fully tailored to optimize picking routes for people that walk through this. And that is uh, great. We spend a lot of time on this, and we could maximize quite a bit. But it also has its limitations. Doing this work is, uh, as you can imagine, it's uh, labor intensive. It's quite heavy. Uh, there's risk of things uh, hitting each other, so it's also not fully safe. It's not the experience that we want for our employers. We want something better. And not only this uh, for our employers, but also we just hit limits of what we can do on one physical location. So if we want to deliver more groceries with the same amount of people, we need to have something else in place. And for that, a couple of years ago, we launched the welcome to the future solution of Picnic to this whole problem, which was a fully automated fulfillment center. So that process where you have people walking around this whole, uh, this big supermarket kind of uh, environment has been replaced with a fully automated system comprised of about 14 kilometers of conveyor belt. Those conveyor belts, they all need to be controlled, and we need to, yeah, we need to control all of this such that we take the right products out of storage, we put them on, uh, we put them to the right people on the floor that actually take a product out of one storage uh, uh, tote and put them into another one uh, uh, in such a way that ultimately we have, again, the groceries repaired that we can ship out. And this operation is massive. This was the largest site that we launched back then. Uh, we now have uh, uh, some, uh, some larger ones, but it was definitely the more, most complex thing that we tried to pull off. Um, to control such an operation, uh, there's a lot of software involved in actually making this happen. So, in essence, there's three levels in which you need to operate such a warehouse. The first one is you need to be aware of what kind of orders are coming in and what kind of orders need to be fulfilled for uh, what kind of moment in time and track that those things are actually uh, starting to happen. Uh, so we need to make sure that the products are actually in-house in order to fulfill those, et cetera. So that's sort of the high level view. That is what we call warehouse management. Then there's a level of warehouse control, which is more about ensuring that the right products are put in the right bags, which are destined for the right people, such that such an order is actually fulfilled. Um, and that is what we call warehouse control. And the last level, especially then in this, uh, in this kind of automated warehouse, you have something we call transport system. So this is actually the software that directly integrates with all of that physical infrastructure that is running on this side. So the conveyor belts, we have uh, millions of scanners, we have actuators, things that, junctions that we can put one direction or the other, a lot of physical stuff that needs to be maintained. Uh, typically, if you would go in such a track, uh, you can get these kind of solutions off the shelf. We have a vendor that is actually building all of these conveyor belts for us. But Picnic, from the start, has been uh, pretty, best, pretty focused on building software themselves, which you normally would get off the shelf. This has been quite a successful uh, method uh, for Picnic. It allowed us to optimize a lot of processes in our supply chain. And we also believe that we should do the same for warehouse control in this case. Warehouse management we already did for our manual FCs. Warehouse control was something you would typically get off the shelf, but this especially here is the place where you can do a lot of optimization and improvements, which you would otherwise have to wait for a third party vendor for you to implement. So with this kind of model, the question came to us as an infrastructure team, like how can we facilitate this? All of this software, you know, where should we run this? So we started to think about uh, the different types of, uh, the way that we should want to do this. And effectively we were able to identify three distinct types of workloads. You know, the first one is the one that we all, I think, here love and uh, enjoy. That's the stateless containerized deployments, that, uh, yeah, your typical uh, Kubernetes deployment that you can easily scale up and down. Um, this is, especially in this case, the picnic software, uh, the things that we always build ourselves because that's what we do from the start. And then, of course, some of the open source solutions that we have around this to facilitate all of that. Then the second one is the stateful VM-based systems. I'll come back to why this is VM-based. But in essence, uh, it's the data stores that we would normally get as a SaaS solution. Um, uh, we now somehow need to run this also close by because it needs to be on-premise. Um, this would be Postgres, RabbitMQ, or it's a typical data store stack. And then the last one, which is definitely a pain for such an operation, especially if this kind of uh, this, or this automated warehouse is destined to support about a quarter or half of, uh, of the primary market that we, uh, that we cater for. 
So operational uh, quality is essential, and then having systems that we know are not highly available uh, means that anything you do with such a deployment effectively means outages, and that's a huge risk for our entire operation. In addition, a couple of, let's say, operational aspects were identified that we needed to be able to achieve. So uh, the operational hours are effectively 22-7, uh, 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 all days except for King's Day. Uh, well, we need to have one celebration at least. Then there's the availability of four nines that we need to achieve because it's such a, a, a critical uh, part of our entire uh, catering to the Netherlands. And then we only have a small team to pull this off. Uh, this combined with sort of the, the key, let's say, aspect of this, of this, of this whole solution, like this was a, a, a massive important milestone for Picnic to prove our long-term, uh, 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 let's say, way of operating, uh, was a quite a critical project. In addition, one, I think, one very unique peculiarity, I think, for such an operation is that um, an operation like this runs at a fixed clock rate. So where normally, of course, you have to deal with web traffic and it goes with your typical web uh, sort of uh, load kind of uh, uh, trend lines, here we have a conveyor belt that connects everything together that runs at a fixed rate. Uh, it's a little bit less than a meter per second. It means that uh, everything that happens here is sort of event-based, so we have scanners everywhere, as I mentioned. They, they detect that the code is coming, uh, coming along, and maybe there's a junction after the scanner. You need to decide, is the code going to go left or right or straight or right? That kind of decision point uh, is everywhere in this operation. It's many, 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 many places. And for any kind of junction point that is being hit by such a toad, it means that that event needs to go from the uh, transport system to the warehouse control system. The warehouse control system actually needs to do some smart thinking to define the next step, then send back the information again. And all that needs to happen in a couple hundred of milliseconds or even less than a hundred milliseconds before that toad already comes to the junction point, for example, that you want to put into a different direction. Um, if you miss this kind of opportunities, these toads will go into a, a wrong direction, and those kind of, uh, let's say, missed diverts, what we call it, are very costly to recover from, because uh, as early phase, it was just physical people that need to go there, pick up the toads, put them back on another conveyor belt, and now we have all kinds of software belt to do for this for us, but it, it does add a lot of complexity on top of our already quite uh, uh, constrained uh, uh, processes that are running here. And that is something that is quite different than you know, some of the other operations that you would typically cater for. So we set out to find a solution that we felt like was able to achieve all of these kind of uh, uh, requirements and all of these kind of types of workloads. Um, uh, we opted for a VMware-based stack uh, that we externally uh, manage, that we let external people manage, uh, and it's fully running on-premise in this uh, location. Um, this specifically was decided with, yeah, you saw this, the team size, not so big. Uh, this allowed us, the, the Picnic infrastructure team, to focus on the actual catering of the workloads. So in this case, uh, the Postgres cluster, RevDMQ, the Picnic workloads around us to make sure that that all works. Um, we opted for running two identical rooms that were fully prepared to run the entire production workload, allowing us to continue operation even if there's a reason to shut down an entire room. You can imagine that if there's a, uh, um, a power outage in that room or you want to do some significant maintenance or refurbishment on the internals, we can, actually continue, we can actually do this without impacting operations because we have that kind of capacity uh, on site in another place. Um, we actually had an issue quite early on where the cooling unit completely shut down in one of the rooms and that allowed us to uh, immediately shift all of the workloads to the other room and continue operation there, which is very handy in such a situation. And the VMware layer actually gives you the opportunity to transparently migrate um, uh, workloads, VM-based workloads from one location to the other. So on one side, it does it for you if actual physical hardware fails, so it detects it and it will start up the uh, VM in another location where there's still capacity. But then also, it offers a, a solution they call live migration, so you can actually move uh, running VMs that are actually part of critical operations. You can do it live, migrate it from one place to the other without impacting operation either. And that especially is a very nice feature to allow us to do all kinds of maintenance to the existing hardware that is there. And then lastly, vSphere comes with a solution they call fault tolerance. And I think this is a very interesting one. It allows you to run uh, any VM-based workload 
in, uh, in replication effectively that was never built to be highly available. In essence, what they do is they run the same VM twice and then uh, 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 synchronize them fully, so on the network stack, on the, on the operations that are executed in the CPU, and only when something goes wrong in one of the two instances will they defer traffic uh, to the one that is still remaining. And especially for the workloads that I uh, described that are not highly available, this was a very important feature for us to add on top of. And then, of course, you know, we still want to do Kubernetes. You know, Picnic and especially the teams building the software to control all of this, they, they've grown up essentially in the company to use Kubernetes. So we want to still have the same offering. And in this case, we opted to run uh, Tansu TKGI. So this is the VM, uh, VMware offered solution for managing Kubernetes clusters. Essentially sort of the EKS of VMware. Um, we opted specifically for this because it gives you something that they call VMware validated design. So in essence, it's VMware that's gonna tell you, sure, uh, if you use all of these components stacked together, then we guarantee that that functions as it should. And that is a nice guarantee because especially if something goes wrong, it's, we can rely on VMware support uh, to take this serious and to help us out to uh, solve these kind of issues. Now, that's all uh, good, and of course, while opting, there's a lot of choices that you have to make and decisions that you have to consider. And especially, I think, for the audience like, uh, like you guys, uh, there's a lot of options that, uh, that might have come already uh, up to mind. So one thing is, of course, you can run Kubernetes directly on hardware, or at least we can find a solution that allows us to uh, just use Kubernetes directly on some physical infrastructure. We opted not to do this, mainly because the workloads that we've already identified, we needed to run those VM-based uh, workloads that are not highly available. Uh, but we also felt that there's too much of a skill gap to also take uh, responsibility for actually maintaining these kind of clusters on the m master node level. We uh, heavily rely on EKS, uh, so we are actually users of Kubernetes and not the operators of actual clusters, at least that's how we see it, and therefore we felt it was too much of a risk to go into the S-direction. You can run, of course, virtual machine workloads within Kubernetes via KubeVirt, which actually is a really cool technology, and I think uh, I would have loved to use it, was it not for such a, uh, a, a critical site uh, at that point in time. Uh, it supports live migration, which is nice, but it's behind the feature gate still, so effectively a beta feature, which is really you know, a bit on the risky side, uh, and of course it didn't have that uh, turn a, a non-HA workload into something highly available, which for us was back then especially quite a miss. We also considered to run Postgres and RabbitMQ in Kubernetes, because now we need to suddenly run VM-based workloads for this. Um, especially then, we were looking at Solando's offering for, for this, uh, which was quite new back in the time. Especially for Postgres, there was a lot of people that would still actively refrain you from using uh, po uh, Kubernetes for running these kind of systems. So we also opted to play it safe and go to something that we at least know. If we go into these boxes, we can actually look at the, you know, th there's no abstractions around this, there's no Kubernetes operators or something else that is uh, making it harder to debug. We can go into these boxes. We had people that knew a lot about Postgres. So that felt a lot safer. And the same goes for RabbitMQ. Of course, we have the operator that is supplied by the RabbitMQ team, uh, but still, if something in that direction goes wrong, we didn't feel the right, uh, we f didn't feel enough prepared to tackle those kind of issues in such a capacity. And lastly, AWS Outpost. I think this one is something that, especially if we would redo this now, would be a very high contender. Um, back then, it was just not generally available for for the Netherlands, we did have good lines and there were some opportunities to try it out. We would be early adopters. And you would see this, for example, in the support for RDS. Back then, uh, the multi-AZ or failover, at least, functionality was not there or not uh, fully ready. Uh, and especially back then, it was massively more expensive than the solution that we opted for with vSphere. Now, I think it would be a very interesting candidate to explore. Now, with such a solution in place, you think, okay, well, we have all of the technology, we have all the tools, we, we feel that these are the right uh, set of technologies, and we hope that with that similar kind of experience that we were looking for with uh, uh, hardware virtualization, all managed, uh, a platform that is similar to EKS, is it as easy to operate? Well, honestly, it's just super complex. We ended up with a completely new tech stack that we had to operate and maintain. We were good in AWS. We, were, you know, we have a lot of experience there. We built a lot of tooling, and we effectively had to duplicate all of this. We were hoping to be able to abstract away these different types of models of operation into modules of Terraform, Enhanceable, et cetera. 
uh, it just doesn't work. The details are uh, too painful to abstract away, uh, which meant we had to do a lot of things twice. Um, for a lot of the technologies, we need to build a custom stack of observability, where otherwise you get these out of the box from AWS or for other providers. Uh, now we needed to do our own observability stack for Postgres and for the proxies that come with Postgres, et cetera. Um, quite a lot of complexity. And then, of course, we do this for the first time. Uh, so, yeah, you're going to run into issues that have already been solved, that others have already been uh, doing better, and that's just a painful operation. So the end result of this is that, yes, we were able to pull it off, um, but we have a huge high operational load, and uh, the reliability was uh, uh, definitely not what we were hoping for. Now, this was not something that was only hard on the infrastructure side. Running this operation was tricky for everybody. It was the most big project that we ever pulled off. Uh, and just getting it also on the physical level working on the operational side, people around it, it was just com super complex. So the uh, corporate development teams were already looking into an alternative way to do this, and they opted for something they call a hybrid FC, effectively uh, less complex in terms of automation, uh, a lot easier to build, a lot faster to build, and uh, better to pull off. Uh, for this project, we opted for another third-party vendor, which actually said, well, I'm pretty okay with you guys running everything from the cloud instead of doing it on-premise. It was something that the other vendor was absolutely uh, against. Uh, and was the reason that drove us to on-premise in the first place. And so with that, we built this, we launched this, it went super smooth. It was like a fraction of the time that we needed to invest uh, compared to the other location. And so the log logical question was, yeah, can we just not do this also for the uh, initial location, FCA? Um, in order to confirm this, there's only one way to do this. You can't really simulate such a complex operation. You just need to do it live. There's no way to validate uh, uh, such a situation. So in essence, we identified, let's say, the key points where we would know uh, in the end state, uh, this is where traffic would go from the cloud to on-premise, and started to introduce uh, artificial latency on small iterations, up until the point that the operations team would come screaming at us, uh, complaining that things were breaking down, give them time again to recover, and then identify if it actually was us, because there's many things going wrong in such a location, and then reassess what we wanted to do. Now, we had to do this multiple times, I think five or six times, super painful for everybody involved. Also, the recovery takes a long time, a lot of effort. But ultimately, we did conclude, yes, we can. And that was amazing, because now we suddenly can think about going back. We can actually say, well, if we want to launch such a location again, we start doing it immediately from the cloud. And if we can get to the cloud for this location as well, we can just cut our operational workload massively. And that is, you know, from a strategic point of view and, let's say, conquering the rest of the, 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 the European market, a super powerful uh, proposition. But then you are in a place where you need to do a lift and shift back to on-premise. Of course, on its own, it's not an easy feat. I mean, it's not the, the largest scope. I think uh, a much larger lift and shift operations have been conducted, but you know, we're already launching new locations. There's a lot of stuff that my team is now involved with, uh, and doing a lift and shift back is not so great. But AWS actually has a, a service uh, that they offer uh, that's called AWS MOP, the Migration Acceleration Program. And if you're large enough and your uh, annual cost is spent that you will end up with uh, paying with them after this migration is, is large enough, they will pay you for doing this. They will uh, make sure that there's resources they get uh, from external parties to actually help you do this. And now we're in the process into preparing all of this, where we as a team, we just validate that the things that they're going to do are sound, and we make sure that you know, operation is fine. But we can sleep between uh, 1 and 3. Uh, they'll do the operation, and they do it uh, very well. And that, for us, is super, super important. So we're very happy with this. Now. If you look at what we sort of learned from this, I think uh, for us spe specifically, and I think for such an audience as here, and, and, and some of you probably already know, but Kubernetes just uh, does not abstract away the actual physical world. Uh, if you rely on, uh, so if you do not have, uh, if you use a a the ALB ingress controller, then of course going to a place where it's not there, it's going to be harder. So if you've opted in for all kinds of uh, SaaS offered solutions that you hook into your, a your Kubernetes cluster, then going to a different location will just not be the same. Uh, a lot of additional complexity comes with this. And even if you outsource the management of physical and, and virtual infrastructure, you still have to deal with physical reality. 
uh, we had a power outage, or well, we had a power vendor that was not very reliable. So every so often, we had uh, the diesel generators kicking in up until the point that the uh, gasoline was just depleted and the whole site came crashing down. Like you, you need to learn this, I guess, in practice. Maybe there's people that do this better, but it's just stuff that you have to deal with. And like I said, the cooling equipment failing, etc. And then uh, you know, working together with these different third-party providers uh, that build such a complex operation for you, if you say that this is mission critical or this is so essential for your organization, they are going to account for this. They're going to add buffers. They're going to make sure uh, there's never any risk in there. And I think it also uh, prevented us from finding a solution that might be much better equipped or fitting to what we as a company are and how we want to operate. And so I think it's important that you always collaborate very closely, understand where these requirements are coming from um, and what is driving them and in, in what capacity do you want to trade, let's say, responsibilities over certain decisions instead of just assuming that everybody just needs to do what they need to do. And I think that's a very powerful thing, especially in such a complex operation. And then the last one is an interesting one. So uh, there's actually an ongoing discussion now from, I think, the guy who created Rails who is now shifting a lot of their uh, cloud infrastructure to on-premise, saying save, it's going to be saving millions and millions. In our case, it's going to be actually more cost-effective to run on AWS. Um, I mentioned already the buffering, uh, some of the deployment requirements that uh, our third-party vendor was asking for. They wanted physical, uh, they couldn't do virtual CPUs, physical nodes only, uh, very high resource usage. And, being able to scale up and down in the cloud would still allow us to you know, better fit this kind of resources instead of buying very massive hard hardware that's hardly used. In addition, you know, the discounts that you get, uh, the liability that you get, and all of the solutions, the functionality that you get out of AWS is something that you otherwise need to invest in yourself. You can do this, but it just requires a different strategy. And so in our case, it's cheaper, and it also allows us, for example, we're now playing around with the, the Graviton instances that are available for running also in Kubernetes. We're experimenting with this and being able to also adopt this now for these kind of uh, locations as well. It's just something that we really love and, and want to see further developed. So that is also something that we uh, massively enjoy of this. And that's it. That's my story of how, we're, how we went to on-premise, how we felt it's not so. Uh, fitting for us and how we're now moving back to the cloud. If you are willing to help out or interested to uh, uh, help build the best milkman that is serving millions of families, then always feel free to join and reach out on the Join the Picnic tab. And uh, I hope you learned something today. Thank you. <laughs>
so the transport system that is in place is effectively the bridge for us between that. Huh? So, so they take it into account, they, they support all of those low-level protocols that sort of they translate to that physical uh, world. And we just purely rely on the events and uh, information that they emit. So we asked our uh, third-party provider of this, yeah, we are really good in RabbitMQ, so whatever happens and that we need to react on, you emit an event on RabbitMQ and we'll take it from there. So we really completely isolated out that kind of physical and classical kind of IT infrastructure so that we can focus on what we think and do best. Any more questions? No? Thank you very much, guys. So, uh, thank you. Brilliant. <laughs>